So good afternoon, um, everyone, or good morning. Um, I'm Sherry Kvora, Ohio State University. I'm the host of the um, webinar series of vegetable grafting. Um, welcome, you guys. Um, thank you for um, um, participating live. And I hope this is another good um, um, interaction with uh, um, participants and then also speakers. So um, today we have a, um, a sort of duo presentation, um, co-presentation from University of California. But before going into the presentation, um, I just wanted to, uh, as usual, announce a couple of things. Um, there you go. So um, we still have um, three more webinars scheduled and more um, uh, beyond June. This year, our plan is to give a monthly webinar for you to learn uh, what the current, what's the current status of science and technologies around vegetable grafting. Um, so um, uh, Richard Hassel is a March um, webinar and uh, Tony Kainas is um, uh, April webinar and Carrie River um, is going to be a um, uh, May webinar. And also, um, I'm open for any requests about speakers. Um, right now, we are um, providing uh, pretty much academic presentations, but it doesn't limit to. So if you have suggested speaker, um, uh, just email me using the email address uh, you are receiving this announcement. And then, um, you're probably tired of hearing this, but we are organizing international symposium, the second um, vegetable grafting symposium. The first time organizing this in North America. So this is a milestone event for our um, vegetable grafting history. So I'd like to have you um, part of this if it is ever possible. So this is more scientific orientation. However, we have, um, um, times and discussion, roundtable event um, uh, for interacting uh, stakeholders, industry people, propagators, users, and extension personnel to think about what needs to be done um, uh, to promote this technology. So it, it's, it's going to be quite interesting event. So with that, um, I would like to uh, introduce um, today's speakers. The title of the presentation is Grafting Experience with Open Field Production of Green Picked Fresh Market and Processing Tomato in California. And then um, Dr. Brenna Agata and Jean Miao. So I'm going to introduce their background a little bit while we are switching the um, sharing um, uh, function from here to um, uh, University of California. So let me stop share. Stop share. All right. And then um, Jean and Brenna, you can start sharing. Why do you are doing that? Let me introduce the first speaker, Dr. Brenna Agata. She's a, a farm advisor on uh, uh, vegetable crops and plant pathology um, at University of California Cooperative Extension. Uh, in charge of, I think, San Joaquin, if I pronounce okay. Yep, San County. Joaquin. Great. Um, she got a master's degree and PhD from University of California Davis, UC Davis. Uh, and then working as a farm advisor uh, in the vegetable crops and plant pathology. The second presenter is uh, also from University of California Cooperative Extension, Jin Miao. Uh, he's a, a vegetable crop farm advisor. And his education is also from UC Davis, um, bachelor's from, uh, um, uh, oh, sorry, uh, BS in uh, uh, plant sciences and master degree in agricultural economics. And he has been working in years on processing tomato production in uh, lower Sacramento Valley area in California. So we have two speakers deep rooted in California today, and uh, we are looking forward and so excited to hear 
California situation, opportunities and issues. Okay, so all yours, Brenna and Jean. Thanks, Jerry. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, good opportunity for uh, both Brenna and I, so thank you. All right, so um, Jean and I are gonna be talking today about um, actually two different projects that we've been working on for a number of years. So Jean sort of spearheaded uh, a multi-year project in processing tomatoes. So we'll be presenting three years um, on that project. And I've recently joined that project as well as uh, Jen Wang joined in 2018. He's uh, also a farm advisor in the San Joaquin Valley. And then um, I'll be talking about uh, a project in fresh market tomatoes that I've been conducting with uh, Scott Stoddard, a colleague down in Merced County, as well as um, Ming Wa Zhang and Mike Granison um, on the UC Davis campus. Um, and that project, the Fresh Market Project, had funding from the state of California um, as well as a USDA specialty crop block grant funds. Um, and then the Processing Tomato Project is funded by um, the USDA Growing New Roots uh, Project. Okay, so a little background, why, why would we want to graft tomatoes? The basic idea is to combine the features of two different cultivars. So from the scion, we're looking for varieties that have the fruit traits that the tomato processors or packing sheds are looking for. And in California, um, we're looking for a highly determinate growth habit um, as we don't have any uh, trellising or support of the plant. From the rootstock cultivar, um, we're looking for resistance or tolerance to these soil-borne diseases and nematodes that many of the rootstocks have, um, increased abiotic stress tolerance that's been shown for many of the rootstocks, um, increased vigor and fruit size and fruiting over a, a longer period that's been demonstrated from many rootstocks. Jean, can I interrupt a second? Sorry, Brenna. Um, Jean, would you please uh, mute your microphone? Because I think picking up uh, voices and it's kind of echoing type of. I can mute you, but then you can't mute back. Oh, okay, great. Okay, so most of these rootstocks um, are interspecific hybrids between cultivated tomato and wild um, tomato species. Um, in California, um, plug connection down in Southern California has been one of the um, primary grafting operations um, for tomatoes, but primarily working um, with, you know, selling to nurseries that are selling to homeowners. So popular thing to have an heirloom tomato um, grafted um, onto a rootstock. And on a related note, um, we have a colleague, um, Margaret Lloyd, who's also on the UC, USDA um, funded project. She's um, based out of the Woodland office, um, and she's uh, working on heirloom tomatoes. So she's looking at Brandywine and Cherokee Purple um, on rootstocks, and she's doing field trials on the UC Davis campus. So um, the rootstocks that we've been looking at um, have actually been bred not for our production system, but have been bred for the, the greenhouse um, production system where the, the high vigor um, of the rootstock allows continued production through a very long uh, season and also provides some tolerance of the variable conditions um, that can sometimes happen in some of the greenhouses. So these are um, pictures from um, our grafting that we did for the Fresh Market project. So um, we started the seed of both the rootstock and the scion in the greenhouse about four weeks before grafting. So then, pointer here. So then um, at four weeks after planting, these um, small seedlings are cut at um, the rootstocks cut just below the cotyledon at a 45 degree angle, and then the scion is cut as well. And then we use these uh, grafting clips to uh, put those on the rootstock stump, and then stick the scion cutting into that clip and uh, 
making sure that we aligned the those two 45 degree angles and also we were trying to match the, the stem diameter. So we did do this with the assistance of Gore's transplanting um, in Salinas, but we, we were involved in the grafting. So after the grafting, they went into a, a healing chamber for one week um, before going back to the greenhouse. So the process did add about one to two weeks onto the total um, time spent um, at the greenhouse. Okay, so this is um, a map showing the locations of the trials that we've been doing. So the processing tomato trials were conducted in the southern Sacramento Valley, and um, the furthest south one would be in the North Delta. So those were four trials, field trials located in commercial fields, and that was over a three-year period. And then the fresh market, um, Trials were conducted in the northern San Joaquin Valley, so those are the ones shown in green. And we had three trials that were in San Joaquin County, which is the very northern end of the San Joaquin Valley, and then another three trials which were in the Legrand or Merced area, a um, little, little further south. So now I'm going to be talking about uh, the processing tomato uh, field trials. Are you late? And for, for me overall... Uh, unmute. Yeah, I got to unmute you. Great. Okay. Okay. So uh, I'm going to, this is Gene Meow. So I'm going to be talking about the processing uh, tomato trials, the field trials that uh, were conducted uh, over the last uh, several years. For me, the primary goal, and I think for Brenna as well, is, is uh, that we were trying to increase uh, plant health. And we thought that uh, the potential for grafting to achieve this uh, greater health uh, you know, was uh, would be interesting. So in in California, in the, in the uh, lower Sacramento Valley, we can see that on the left hand side, the image of very vigorous plants uh, uh, looking healthy um, during the fruit sizing time period or growth stage, and then it gets to be about three weeks before anticipated harvest, and then we start losing that vigor and uh, lose canopy cover, a lot of leaf necrosis uh, occurs, and we're trying to uh, improve upon that uh, and, and even reduce the, the number of sun burning for the canning tomato, uh, 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 you know, the number of calls from that. So here's the experimental setup for us. Uh, we chose uh, three cyan in this case. And in California, we commonly have over 100 varieties being grown in any particular season. Maybe 50 of those are, you know, have some volume to it. Um, and, and maybe about the top 10 or so might occupy a third to 50% of the volume. So 10, 10 cultivars, you know, have the lion's share. And so we selected three of these. These are all about in the top 10 um, and very popular varieties. Uh, and this was a 2017 trial. Uh, and then we selected the rootstocks, three rootstocks, and these were all from Deruder. They happened to be, and we know that Maxifort or Multifort, at least through our eyes, were uh, very popular or sort of standard rootstocks. And then we, we put in uh, this third, this DR um, uh, rootstock. So a three by three uh, trial, factorial, nine combinations. And then we wanted to uh, look at a control, and the controls were our three cyan, which were non-grafted. So 12 total treatments. Randomized complete block, a replicated test, plot size. Uh, our initial standard was to uh, go for 100 foot long plots on a single uh, plant uh, bed uh, as an individual plot. Two of the four trials, uh, we had to reduce the uh, length of the plot because we had, um, uh, we, we lost plants along the way after grafting and uh, prior to establishing them in the, in the field, we lost plants. So we had to shorten the plot length to about uh, 66 feet or so. One of the trials, one of the four trials, we had double plant lines and on a wider um, a bed and that was the exception there. Mechanically transplanted either by the grower uh, equipment and crew or by a custom operation but a commercial operation uh, nonetheless. 
Uh, all these plants are handled individually by, uh, uh, by a person. They're feeding the transplanter. The planting depth for tomatoes in California is relatively deep. So the top of the, of the root ball might be three inches or more below the, the bed top. And so these are deep plantings. The cyan is, uh, is planted uh, into, into the soil. So it's not uh, uh, above uh, uh, the soil surface. Drip irrigation was the irrigation, standard irrigation method. Uh, some fields were established with, uh, with sprinklers to begin with. These were all commercial fields without um, known disease or, or uh, abiotic uh, extreme conditions. We were trying to look at the yield potential of these grafted plants. We did have one of the three trials was uh, in a, verticillium wilt, a known verticillium wilt uh, field, and that was the exception to our, to our trials. Mechanical harvest, uh, once over destructive harvest. We're talking about uh, 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 in terms of harvesting the entire plot. So these are more or less uh, a thousand pounds for individual plot that are collected for harvestable yields up to over 2,000 pounds per plot. So these are half acre size uh, uh, experimental areas within these commercial fields. This is showing in one of the tests in that 2017 field, we are seeing uh, the, the 319 uh, cultivar where uh, on the left hand side it's uh, uh, non-grafted and on the right hand side uh, that is between the yellow lines that is DRI 319 on top of uh, the rootstock multi-fort. And we can see that uh, hopefully you'll see that uh, much greener plants on the on the right hand side there. Another example within the same experimental area very close to harvest is uh, um, 6428, uh, the variety uh, on the left-hand side is uh, on the rootstock Maxifort, and on the right-hand side, the conventional. And with that, in this particular test, there's a little spotty infestation of uh, unknown to, uh, to us at the time we planted, but uh, southern blight. And Maxifort uh, has some tolerance to uh, southern blight, but not all that plot I say it was very spotty. There weren't very many strikes of the southern blight. And so we can see that the reduction in leaf necrosis is uh, quite striking uh, with our, some of our grafted uh, uh, treatments. Here's the trial uh, results. And we're only showing a, a really a, a very a few uh, data uh, collection points or variables. Uh, we were centered on on yield in this case and bricks. But uh, the layout of this trial is that we're showing, at least on the table, is that uh, all the sign are lined up. Uh, the first four are just with 6428 and the middle four are a different uh, cultivar. Uh, but the rootstocks are always lined up uh, in this repeating order, Maxifort, Multifort, and uh, the DR uh, rootstock. And what we can see uh, is that in terms of overall, when we compared um, grafted versus non-grafted, about an eight ton yield increase with our grafted on average, and the highest significant uh, uh, difference um, in terms of the uh, uh, analysis of variance. And uh, with these uh, yellow sort of bars, we're seeing that uh, compared to the non-grafted, our control, we see these uh, uh, percentage uh, yield increases, uh, almost a 20% yield increase on average. And then we see that the fruit sugars are dropping, that our fruit sugars uh, with the grafted has uh, reduced the level of fruit sugars. And we commonly see that in some of our tests. We hope that it wouldn't occur, but we commonly see that with higher yields, we get a reduction in fruit sugars. It's just really an inverse relationship between uh, fruit sugars and, um, uh, and yields. And this was a factorial experiment, and so uh, we, we were more or less less interested experimentally in the, in the cyan. We got uh, clear mean separation between our, our cultivars, our cyan uh, lines. The rootstocks in this case are three rootstocks, all perform similarly. We can see that uh, uh, overall here that the, the yields are are so similar to each other, so not a, a non-statistical, non-significant uh, difference there. 
And important in our factorial analysis, we see and we've repeatedly seen that we do not see this interaction between the, the scion and the rootstock, that there's not some real unique um, uh, combination uh, in terms of uh, performance, at least on, uh, on yields. Our coefficient of variation or our test, uh, at least for yields, are, uh, has uh, low variation. And now uh, looking at uh, a 2018 field trial in the North Delta in an area geographically between where Brenna is located and where I am in the, in the lower Sacramento Valley. This is a test in the, in the North Delta on some sort of a, a silty clay or a more clay, higher clay type soil. Uh, you can see the, uh, uh, the trial area as it got closer to harvest. Uh, same three cyan were used uh, that we started off with. Uh, the rootstocks, uh, Maxifort and Maltifort, were the background, both the rooter materials, and we included a, uh, a non-disclosed rootstock, uh, pre-commercial in this case, but non-disclosed. Uh, transplant date was relatively late for California, although uh, there are commercial plantings of canning tomatoes that will go into early uh, June. But our harvest was also delayed. We would have expected uh, in a normal year that uh, the trial would be harvested in the first week of October. So this was delayed 10 days or two weeks. Uh, but this was an open fall season, so uh, that extra time probably was uh, beneficial to our, our grafted uh, plants. Here are um, uh, showing uh, the table of uh, yield and some fruit quality results. Same sort of situation where the, the first four uh, lines are the same sign, in this case 319, then following up for the next four, uh, the same cultivar, and the rootstocks are, are lined up in the same uh, matching order. What we saw overall is this, that Maxifort and Multifort, those two, two rootstocks increase yields almost 40% substantial yield increases. And we can see that um, you know, when we encircle these percentage uh, increases in the, in the table itself, uh, averaging overall about a 27% uh, increase, even though our non-disclosed rootstock uh, really uh, was sort of flat line in terms of uh, yield performance uh, compared to our control. Sort of repeating uh, these high yield uh, treatments, uh, uh, we're also, you can see that they reduced the BRICS levels. So that inverse relationship showing up again. In this case, Maxifort, uh, in some instances, and arithmetically overall, that it, uh, it lowered uh, uh, fruit color. And, and in California, fruit color is uh, one of the traits that we have a very good uh, a red color in our fruit. Now, this may be the most important slide for me in, in my portion of the presentation. Uh, this is a combination of uh, showing a uh, limited amount of data, prim the primarily the, or exclusively the yields. And these are four trials begun in from uh, uh, 2016 and uh, then showing uh, the results in 2018 as, as well. Yield increases ranging from 8 to 27%. Agronomically, just uh, very encouraging in terms of uh, raising the bar for yields. These, uh, these are relatively high yielding fields. You know, we can look at uh, a 50 ton uh, yields, uh, you know, 80 ton yields. So these are very high yielding fields. Great uh, statistical difference, highly significant between the grafted and the non-grafted. And some of these uh, uh, treatments within the individual trial as much as 55%. So substantial yield increases we've seen some from some particular treatments. And I'd say overall associated with uh, Maxifort and Multifort uh, rootstocks of the ones that we have, we have tested. Again, overall, we're not seeing any interaction between cyan and rootstock. So that's a very interesting um, observation uh, across our trials. We would expect there that there would be some uh, interaction uh, with, with, some, uh, with some combinations, but we have not seen that. Our uh, level of variation for yield is very tight, 5% uh, to 7% are a very low amount of variation within the fields for yield uh, measurements. 
and 12s uh, are, are very uh, good as well. So we have very high confidence in our, in our results from uh, our canning tomato trials. What other things did we see? Increase in plant vigor, in plant health, it increased it. Um, and we're encouraged by that. Canopy cover, protecting the fruit uh, against sunburn, we're seeing that. Sort of detrimentally, we're seeing increase in uh, vine size, maybe a 10% or so increase in vine size on these already large vine varieties. So we're not, we don't need that. We need to have yield increases without increasing vine size in, in my view. And with that, we're seeing delayed maturity. We think that our yields are coming from these late setting fruit primarily. We haven't measured what's happening with, uh, you know, with these early couple of uh, uh, early flower sets, but we're seeing delayed maturity. And then overall, we haven't seen very many uh, wild shoots emerging from uh, from the rootstocks, uh, and we know that those uh, shoots from the rootstocks are are non-productive. They're competitive. They just get in the way. So we don't need. Uh, but we have seen very few in some trials. No, none of these uh, wild shoots. I, I, need, I want to also uh, include some cost analysis because that's important to our, for our canning tomato industry. This is a, a cost study that Brennan and I conducted in, in 2017 uh, with, uh, along with the Ag Economics Department uh, at UC Davis. We see overall that uh, in this hypothetical farming operation that we see about uh, 3,300 uh, dollars per acre as the total cost. The assumptions are 44 tons per acre, uh, $72.50 uh, per ton crop, uh, you know, less than four cents uh, a pound for, uh, for our crop. And if we did the math, the, these, uh, the revenue is less than $3,200. So we're not making money, growers are not making money on the long haul uh, with this kind of uh, uh, cost scenario. In terms of uh, seed cost, uh, about three cents uh, to grow them in the in the greenhouse. Uh, another three cents. We're discounting uh, in this case, uh, ignoring the uh, transplanting costs into the field. Our transplant populations might range from seven thousand to over ten thousand plants per acre. We're using six uh, eight thousand plants, and that's six cents a piece. You know, a little less than five hundred dollars uh, for these uh, transplants. So if we looked at the scenario of using grafted plants and we stayed with 8,000 plants per acre and, and we used the assumption that uh, a price was 60 cents uh, for both the seed and, and the graft and growing and the grafting, then it would take, that expense would be about $4,800 just for these seedlings. And at $75 a ton, we'd need to have 64 tons just to pay for the cost of the grafted seedlings. And we added 44 tons to that uh, as a base, uh, that's over 100 tons per acre. And we fairly, we seldom see uh, over 100 ton yield uh, in, our, in our production fields. So we know, or we believe that uh, we need to reduce the planting rate to, to make the grafting attractive. We need to have uh, some help with uh, reduced uh, grafting costs, uh, maybe automation through automation. We need to increase uh, revenue, whether that's increased yields or increased crop prices. So we need help along those lines. So it's sort of the what if scenario. If grafted plants were, the cost was reduced in half to 30 cents, and if we reduced our plant population, the planting rate down to half uh, and spread them out to 26 inches apart, um, and we looked at that scenario, $1,200 for the grafting then, and then uh, the conventional we said was about five hundred dollars. The the price differential between grafting and our conventional would be seven hundred twenty dollars. The price differential, and that equates to about a ten ton per acre um, increase that's needed. And if we look at California, it's about a fifty ton per acre average production. We saw these twenty percent yield gains. That's very achievable. That would equate to ten tons, but that is just break even. So uh, in my view, I think that uh, you know, we need to have 50% uh, yield increases, even with this uh, cost reduction, to make this attractive uh, in, in California canning tomato production. Maybe even a 
2x, get up to that 100 tons per acre if uh, we don't get uh, price breaks for uh, uh, grafting or for uh, reducing plant population. So a pretty steep uh, hill to climb. I think in California, you know, if we were thinking about uh, car, being a car purchaser, we'd like to be uh, buy Teslas, but I think we're the processing tomato industry is more on a Toyota type budget. So, um, uh, we, we have, uh, we still have a, a ways to go before this gets adopted in California, I believe. Rena. All right, gonna unmute me and I'm gonna mute. Okay. All right. So now we're going to switch gears and talk about um, the trials uh, Scott Stoddard and I conducted in fresh market tomatoes. So again, these were um, also trials conducted within commercial fields. And um, this is just an example of a, um, of a trial. So the um, fresh market tomatoes actually look in California look fairly similar to processing tomato field, highly determinate uh, varieties. Um, in this case, the fields uh, furrow irrigated, but quite often they are grown on buried drip. And um, so there's no um, plant support, and um, these would be harvested one time um, at about 87 to 90 days after transplanting when the first setting fruit are starting to ripen. So they are hand picked by hand, um, but they're picking only the mature green fruit, and then those are ripened at the packing shed. Why is that? Doesn't afford? OK, there we go. Um, so this, um, this is an example of our, commercially they would pick the fruit into buckets, but for the trials, we just cut the whole plant and um, shake the fruit. So that's what it looks like. There you have a few ripe fruit, but mostly just mature green. Okay, so um, the, these plants, again, I mentioned they were um, hand grafted at Gore's Transplanting Facility in Salinas. Um, the bed configuration in these fields was all, um, 60 inch centers and then depending on the trial it was either a 16 inch in row spacing or a 20 inch um, in row spacing and then we had four uh, replicate plots um, each one being each one being 40 feet um, at harvest we were taking a 10 foot section from each plot and then um, sizing the fruit and, and culling um, as they would do at the packing shed. So we get both a total fruit biomass number as well as a marketable yield number. So this, over the three years, we've looked at a number of different scions and these would just um, be varieties um, generally that were developed for, the, for this mature green um, tomato industry in California. And then um, we've looked at a number of rootstocks as well, mainly, um, primarily the trials have looked at Maxifort and the same DR rootstock that was in the processing trials. But then in the final year, we did add um, a few other rootstocks. So I'll show some, some preliminary results for those. So as Jean already explained, um, we're basically doing this as a factorial with um, all of the combinations of the different scions and different rootstocks and then comparing that to a non-grafted Cyan control. Okay, so um, going back to 2016, um, so this is the results for the trial that was in San Joaquin County, and um, it's showing yield in boxes per acre. So this would be 25 pound um, boxes, and the green is the non grafted yield, and then blue would be on the same scion on Maxifort or uh, the red bars are on the DR rootstock. So he, here um, you've got Bobcat as the scion and then these other scions. Galilea is a Roma type variety. 
The other three varieties would be round types. Um, Dixie red is actually um, one I believe is from the east, but um, the other two would be California varieties. So um, in this trial, we saw a pretty good um, yield increase. It's 31% with Maxifort overall, if averaged over the all four scions. And if you look at both rootstocks together, the overall advantage was 25% yield increase um, with grafting. Now moving to um, the same year, but a different location um, down in Legrand in Merced County. Um, you can see this is a much higher yielding site. So whereas the last trial, um, our yields were under 2,000 boxes per acre, now in Legrand, we're more up into the um, above 2,000 and up even above um, 3,000 boxes per acre. So um, this trial was kind of mixed depending on the scion and there was actually, this is one trial where we did see a significant interaction between scion and rootstock. So if you look at bobcat, it looks um, pretty flat, really no big differences, but with HM 1794 and Dixie Red, we actually saw yield decreases with grafting. And uh, um, we don't really have an explanation for this, um, but um, certainly um, was disappointing. Overall, if you averaged all of the um, grafted plants, it was a 17% yield decrease with grafting. Okay, now going to back to San Joaquin County in the following year, um, again, um, a little bit higher yielding than 2016, but still not as high as the Merced County site. And overall, again, Maxi Ford, about 31% yield increase, and the DR rootstock, a 29% yield increase. So that averages out to 30%, so that's fairly consistent with what we saw um, the previous year in a similar location. Now, Legrand in 2017, again, very high yields. And basically, either a small increase with grafting or, depending on the scion, no increase. Overall, the average, it averages out to a 7% yield increase with grafting. But again, these were very, um, a very vigorous site with um, large plants to begin with. Okay, 2018, um, the San Joaquin County site. Here you'll see the, the blue and the red bars remain the same rootstocks that they were in the previous slides, but now we've added some colors. Um, Arnold is that peach colored bars, and then just for this one scion, we have also Estimino and Guardior um, here purple and turquoise. And then the green remains um, as the non-grafted control, as it was in the previous slides. So uh, this was kind of the high water mark, I think, for our fresh market trials um, this past season in San Joaquin County. Very high um, yield increases for marketable yield. Overall, it was a 46% yield increase with grafting. And now 2018 in Merced County trial, a little bit, little bit mixed here. Um, again, a little bit of variation depending on the scion. So, um, but you can see there's some combinations where you do get a significant. So if I've got a, a percentage listed there at the top of the bar, that means that was a significantly different from the non-grafted. So 21%, 20%, 24 if you average all of the grafted plants in the whole trial, it was about a 12% um, yield increase at this location. So just to kind of show you visually, um, on the left would be um, kind of typical what we saw in the San Joaquin County sites, where um, we again, we had lower yield and not super high vigor. And on the left would be, the left row in the picture would be plants that were grafted compared with um, non-grafted plants on the right. 
So visually, huge difference. I mean, the non-grafted plants are not even fully covering um, the bed, whereas the grafted plants are fully using up the, the area. In contrast, on the right, um, this would be um, a Merced County site, so um, higher yielding, um, much more vigorous plants. Um, at harvest, it's very difficult to even walk um, down through the field in, in the furrow. So, and, and uh, the differences between grafted and non-grafted at this site were not, were still visually apparent, but were not as, not as clear cut as um, in the San Joaquin County sites. All right, this summarizes the three years. So the top set of numbers would be from the three sites in Merced and the bottom numbers would be from the three sites in San Joaquin. These would be on the left would be fruit biomass numbers. So that's um, total tons per acre, regardless of whether it's a marketable fruit or not. So it's gonna include undersized fruit, you know, too small to be marketable and as well as coals. And then over here, these would be the box numbers um, for marketable yield that we've been looking at in those bar charts. Okay, so those Merced, those three Merced trials, overall, really for um, fruit biomass, these numbers are the same. For marketable yield, again, they're the same. So there were some differences from year to year. If you remember 2016, we actually had a decrease. Um, 2017, small increase um, and then about 11% in 2018. But if you average that out, it, it comes out to no difference. San Joaquin County trials, for, for total fruit biomass, it's about a 17% increase with grafting, marketable yield averaging a 33% increase. So now if you were to take all six trials and put them all together, the yield advantage from grafting was, was 12%. Okay, so here's my take on a kind of a um, economic analysis for fresh market tomatoes. So um, in this instance, we're gonna assume that the conventional transplants, the grower's gonna pay $74 per thousand plugs and um, we're going to assume a, a planting density of about 5,800 plugs per acre. So $430 per acre would be your uh, conventional cost for plants. Um, and just a, scenario, a potential scenario here with grafted transplants, $600 per thousand, so 60 cents per plant. And then we're going to say, well, let's reduce the planting density. Um, we already have lower plant densities in fresh market tomatoes compared with what Jean was talking about for processing, so we're not going to be able to probably reduce it in half, but I'm, I'm using a number of um, 4,350 plant plugs per acre. So our establishment cost would be $2,600 per acre with grafting. Okay, so th these yield numbers here, would be the average yields that I had from my three trials in San Joaquin County. So without grafting a yield of 1,800 boxes per acre and with grafting a 33% increase to 2,400 boxes per acre. So 33% yield increase, that's probably best case scenario. You know, again, maybe feasible for a low yielding site, but maybe not for a higher yielding site. So these would be our, um, our cultural costs to grow the crop are increased, of course, because of our higher establishment costs for grafting. And then these would be the, the costs to harvest, which are also gonna go up with a higher yield. So this would be our total cash costs. And so if we look, look at um, an array of different um, prices received per box, because the market, of course, for fresh market tomatoes varies throughout the season, but if we look at a range from five to $9 per box, um, these would be the gross and the net costs for conventional and for grafted. And then this final column would be your net revenue difference. So the difference between your net with conventional transplants and your net with grafted. 
And you can see here that in order to get to um, a net revenue difference where grafting makes more money than conventional, you need to be up into the range of above, you know, somewhere between seven and eight dollars per box. And of course, we know this varies from year to year and over the season, but I would say that eight dollars per box is not a price that we um, often get to reach um, for fresh market tomatoes. So I think kind of echoing what Jean said that at the at 60 cents per grafted plant, this probably doesn't doesn't pencil out. So we need to see um, either the price of grafted plants come down or um, you know an increase in revenue from from either yield or price. Okay, so in conclusion from these six trials, um, we did observe that um, the grafted plants had higher vigor. Um, we saw that there was better fruit cover at harvest, um, which when we do have uh, high temperatures, as harvest approaches, we do get sunburn, so that was reduced with grafting. Um, we did observe a, a shift in the fruit size distribution towards large and extra large fruit, um, so that was part of the um, part of the yield increase was um, an increase in fruit size. Unfortunately, um, they don't really want extra large fruit because those are actually harder for them to to market. So, a, a shift from small to medium is good, but a shift from large to extra large is is not so good. Um, we didn't notice any problems with fruit quality, um, both externally, we also cut open the fruit and looked at them inside, and we didn't see any issues caused by grafting. Okay, so at, again, at the three um, lower yielding sites, um, we saw an, a grafting increase, of, I mean, a yield increase of 33% over the three trials, but at um, higher yielding sites, we didn't see an advantage to grafting. And again, overall, I guess if you were to just average out all the experience we had, we'd say there was a 12% yield increase. And then I just wanted to mention, we, um, Scott and I, with colleagues at UC Davis, recently um, published a paper that's a, a meta-analysis. Um, and this looking at grafted tomato studies that have been published in the literature um, from all over the world. Um, and this graph shows, is, fr is from that paper, it shows the, the yield of, of a grafted plant on this axis versus the yield of a non-grafted plant. So all these points represent, each point represents a study or a treatment combination from a study, like a, a scion rootstock combination. All the dots that are above the line would be a, a yield increase. and all the dots below would be actually a, um, a yield decrease. Yeah. Um, so what they what what we found is that um, there was actually statistically significant higher yield in only thirty five percent of the experimental um, treatments, and no difference. So no difference would be all these that are relatively you know close to this line that would be 58 percent of the treatments and then six percent were actually lower so um, and these were of course are very diverse studies some of them had very high disease pressure others didn't so there's all sorts of different uh, scenarios and widely different rootstocks but interesting to see that um, grafting did not always result in a yield increase and then that yellow dot here represents the average, and the, the average was a 20% yield increase, which actually does sort of line up with um, our observations. Okay, so to kind of summarize, I think, for, for both, and here I'm going to welcome Jean if you want to chime in, but um, I think the primary challenge for us here in California is that um, the grafting just really increases the cost of establishment. Um, so that's a big challenge for us here. Um, you got to pay for the rootstock seed as well as that grafted plant. Um, I think a, a, another challenge, though, though probably secondary to that cost, is just the logistics at the greenhouse. So I think we're already challenged here in California to produce enough transplants for the, um, the acreage that we have here. So adding 
the rootstock space for the rootstock seed germination, um, and then also um, that special healing facility um, for the grafting process could be a challenge. So um, potentially um, higher yield, um, but with that um, comes uh, potentially lower soluble solids for processing tomatoes. Um, I see that potentially maybe we could be looking at um, slightly higher input costs for grafted tomatoes aside from the establishment um, costs. And then, um, as Jean mentioned, there's this, this concern with delayed maturity in processing tomatoes, which um, could be a problem. So we, we weren't studying um, soil-borne diseases in our studies, but we know that these rootstocks do have um, better resistance or tolerance to soil-borne diseases. However, the way that we're currently planting um, in California, that uh, Jean mentioned, the, the grafting union is getting planted well below the surface of the soil. So that means that the scion can root, it's not gonna form the majority of the root system, but there can be rooting um, of the scion and that potentially could be compromising um, this soil-borne disease resistance. And I think that would be, the, obviously we could change our practices, but I think that would, it would be hard to change our practices. We're, we're using buried drip irrigation that's quite deep and the top uh, surface soil um, has herbicides in it. So it, we would have to change a lot of different practices in order to keep that, um, that union above ground. Um, also, Two of the major diseases that uh, we have here would be Fusarium wilt race three and Verticillium wilt race two. And um, there are few to no rootstocks that have resistance to those, so. And then um, we know that the rootstocks have, often have abiotic stress tolerance. Um, and I guess just the, the only downside of that is that perhaps the yield advantage uh, may be better at some locations than others and maybe not predictable. And again, we saw better fruit cover and less sunburn, um, but we, with these larger vines, um, it it's becomes in our production system, it can become a challenge to have. We don't really want a larger vine. We want a healthier vine, but not a larger vine. So um, we may need to, um, to manage the vines with vine training or vine trimming to keep them out of the furrows. So that's an, that would be an added uh, expense. And uh, also I think um, potentially, you know, to get to reach these really higher yields, this, you know, 50% yield increase that we'd like to see, it could be that there could be some more uh, specificity to the combination of scion and rootstock. So, you know, in general, again, we didn't really see an interaction between scion and rootstock, but it could be that the really high yielding combinations may be a particular combination. Okay, for the fresh market um, project, um, I would like to um, thank Scott Stoddard, my co-PI, as well as Mike Granison and Ming-Hua Zhang at UC Davis, and then our um, funding came from um, the State Department of Pesticide Regulation and USDA, and then we had a lot of um, co cooperation from the seed companies, as well as Josh Chase with Growers Transplanting, and then we were working in commercial fields, so we would like to acknowledge our um, cooperating growers, Live Oak and Pacific Triple E. And then on the processing side, um, our collaborator is Zheng Wang, who's a farm advisor in, in the Modesto office here with Cooperative Extension in California. Um, and uh, an, a different set of grower cooperators for that project. Um, and then a large list of, of industry um, collaborators that have really helped us along the way at various points. And we'd like to give a shout out to, uh, to California's Tomato Research Institute as well. We have equipment from them that we use for these experiments that were supplied by CTRI. So uh, they, they've been uh, uh, a strong research supporter. For, for our programs. Okay, Jane, would, would you like to unmute your microphone so that you two can speak? I will try.
let's see. Yeah. Okay. All right, good. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. It's wonderful, um, interesting report. Um, so I'd like to open um, for the audience um, questions. Um, feel free to use your microphone and ask questions. We have a few more minutes. I have, Five a, minutes. I have a quick question. Um, do you know, do you have a sense of what the environmental differences were in the fresh market trial between 2016 and 2018? Um, you mean like weather? I mean, it could be weather or like, did you guys use the same grafting nursery or was the field crew different? I'm, I'm just getting, I'm trying to get a so, sense of what the variability Right. Was so it was them. not the same field, but it was the same region, okay. um, the same farm. So, you know, would have been same farmer but different ranch okay. and and the point also is that uh between the stanislaus uh, that wasn't really your question but between the uh these two different advisors the scott stoddard and the brenna trials they were grafted at the same facility and the same uh planting window so they're, they're really paired together and the results are very different so yeah. you know that's... but you're you're asking 2016 versus 2018 yeah i mean yeah. i just there's a, you know, there's a really, it's highly variable. Like you see a 25% increase and then negative 17% decrease. So I was just trying to get a sense of, um, you know, maybe right. So, really yeah, that that's between the two different um, regions. The two, and so those sites were pretty different. Um, the Legrand being just a higher yielding field to begin with. Okay. And, and I, at least for the processing tomato side, I mean, again, I know that wasn't your question, but, um, you know, 2017 was, for, in California, was had uh, extensively high temperatures. And so that was, uh, that was very different in that particular year, 2017. Mm -hmm. But I would say, well, at least from the canning tomato experience, and then looking at the, the, the fresh market uh, data, is that you know, the environment, that uh, environmental influence is very strong on tomatoes. Um, but, you know, the grafting as a technology doesn't buffer the yield component from, uh, from that environmental influence. It might help it out a bit, but it doesn't totally, you know, protect it so that you could not say that, you know, we can get 70 ton yields uh, with grafting and it will always be 70 tons or 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 better it's it's helpful but not a you know not a a, a guarantee okay. i have also just one more um comment or question um i saw i only saw a significant difference in bricks in my um heinz 5108 scion and maxi fort was significantly lower in bricks but some of the other rootstocks that we trialed were actually significantly higher in bricks for that scion. Um, but for the rest of the scion being um, another Heinz variety, 8504, and then uh, a high lycopene inbred and a processing tomato from the Ohio program, there were no sig significant differences in bricks for our two environments. Yeah, uh, so, so those were just comments, I guess, Sean? Yeah. Yeah, and, and I, 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 think, um, I think it's a little unclear. You know, these are only a few trials, a few different varieties for us, so we don't get a clear picture. Uh, but I, 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 I'd say overall that with the canning tomato trials that we're, you know, I, I don't think we can predict what the outcome is. Uh, and we clearly see across the board sometimes really extremely high yields and 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 very high uh, bricks levels and then j most of the time sort of the opposite because it's it's so i think uh, so moisture management related mm -hmm. as well as you know the genetics okay thank you yeah no thank you sean and uh sorry we didn't talk about the uh the disease control work very much uh at all and uh th thanks for you know thanks for sending us uh 
uh, material for the, the first selling oil. Yeah, no problem. So here's a question in the chat line. Um, are there any difference in the dates of planting and harvesting between two sites, Masid and Stockton? Okay, yeah, so in the fresh market, oh. The question is about the planting dates in the fresh market trials between those two and regions, and they were quite similar, like mm -hmm. usually harvesting two to days to a week apart. So harvesting, harvesting, starting day, planting and harvesting, yeah, yeah. would be yeah. both pretty. You know, we we were planting in um, generally in the first half of May and then harvesting in August, but the but the differences between the two tr locations was small mm. like days okay any other yeah. questions well oh. i know i would also add to to brenna's is that i i would generally say slightly different from uh high temperatures that uh the northern locations would be a little cooler uh, as compared to uh the scott Sauter Legrand type uh location so a little bit more modified in in the north as compared to the, the south question any question so in terms of um, delay in the maturity gene, um, yes. is it because it takes longer to ripen, um, ripe the fruit, or it's, it's because it's late flowering? No, I, you know, I don't know late flowering, Sherry. I, th I think, you know, for the canning tomatoes, uh, it's common that uh, first ripe fruit might be five weeks certainly four by four weeks uh, before before actual harvest and then there's you know people estimate that it's about a three percent per day and not not uniformly but about three percent per day ripening uh, sort of uh, uh, time frame and so these early ripening fruits are are just sitting on the vine uh, in the field uh, so it's not a one-time ripening they're all coming on at the same time in terms of a red ripe uh, but for the grafting the observation is that uh, we have you know we're likely uh, it's setting a little bit later as well uh, it's continuing continuing to set later and so to capture that kind of yield we're really uh, optimal harvest for the grafting is is going to be delayed and, and and that that makes some of the first ripening fruit uh, prone to some of the ripe fruit rots so you know another pest pressure so um, you know that's that's not uh, that's not desirable if it can be uh, you know it could be harvested in the same time frame um, and just more fruit or larger fruit mm -hmm. anyone else Hello, uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, I was unclear on the interaction between the rootstock and scion that you said was different than the other uh, maxi fort, et cetera, trials that you guys did. Was it negative? The, the interaction uh, in the one trial? Uh, unmute, please. Yeah, it, you, you had said that there was some um, different interactions between rootstock and, and scion that you didn't expect? Um, I don't, I don't know. You're so, I think we're talking about, um, if I can get back to it. Um, I think I stand 2017 in, in Merced. Merced. Yeah. Okay, so at this, so in most of our trials, we haven't seen an interaction. Now an interaction means that the the impact of the rootstock depends on the scion. So in this case, um, quality 27 and quality 47, well, quality 27, you saw a yield increase, right? With grafting. Quality 47, no. And then quality 99, it depended on whether it was Maxifort or Maxifort decreased, but Deruder, there was an increase, I mean, DR, there was an increase. And then I can minimize this. And then um, for the HM 1794, it again depended on, so that's, this is the interaction here, is with HM 1794, Maxifort was the good one. For quality 99, the DR rootstock was the good one. Do you see that? That's what I'm talking about in terms of the interaction. It's that there is this specific 
matching, like, well, if you're going to grow HM1794, you better use Maxifort. But if you're going to grow 99, maybe. And now I wouldn't say, make a conclusion with just from one trial. But sure. if this was repeatable, you'd say, if you're growing 99, you got to use this rootstock, DR. If you're using 17, growing 19, 1794, you got to use Maxifort. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. That clears yeah, and, it, and it's probably yeah. going to be that there are going to be these inter interactions. We just didn't see them in the canning tomato trials, but there probably are going to be those ones. So, you know, it really involves a lot of testing with those specific combinations, likely. Um, another question is, um, is there, was there a difference in terms of irrigation, fertigation between grafted and non-grafted plants? I guess the question for both. Yeah, for the canning tomato ones, no, they're they're planted in the same trial, randomized, complete block. So they're just all uh, being irrigated with uh, with yeah. very drip and, and at a one and a one schedule uh, yeah. scenario. So it's not yeah. uh, some of them receive more fertilized uh, plant nutrient applied plant nutrients or more water, um, uh, but we don't think we're bottlenecking the uh, grafted plants. Yeah, and what about Brenna? Fresh market tomato. Trial. Yeah, so they were all planted side by side. But in terms of between sites, I would say the only difference would be that um, in two out of the three years, so 2017 and 2018 in San Joaquin, it was furrow irrigated. And then all three years in Merced were, were drip very drip irrigation but treat it all same way but yeah but, and yeah them. oh yeah within the trial it was all yeah. uniform i was yeah. just yeah. pointing yeah. out that there were some differences in irrigation between um between the trials yeah yeah, yeah. I, I was wondering it, it's not so much the case for tomato but um for cucavit uh we usually ad advise to start uh, nitrogen fertilization very low um, particularly when grafted plants are used. And then I wonder if that can manage the vine bigger um, so it, it doesn't get really bulky, um, but sort of slow down. Yeah, no, that, that's, a, that's an interesting uh, management uh, uh, suggestion. And um, uh, that, that's very interesting. So there could be some manipulations uh, done with that uh, too. To, to help um, um, and, and actually lower plant population would uh, would be helpful as well because uh, then they they tend you know with really high plant population they tend to be uh, quickly vegetative uh, because of all that competition so thinning out the you know reduced stand uh, uh, could uh, reduce that early vegetative growth uh, but probably come on a lot later as yeah. well so yeah. But All interesting right. uh, suggestions. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we are a little bit over time. Um, so I, I hate to say, but we, we need to conclude so that you can move on to the next schedule today. Um, um, so I would like to thank Brenna and then also Jean um, from University of California Cooperative Extension for this wonderful, wonderful webinar and sharing all the information with us. So thank you so much. Yeah, and th th thank you to the audience for uh, joining us. And thank you very much, Sherry. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Bye-bye. Uh, bye. -bye. bye.